it is time for our weekly live stream. And here I am in front of my reef tank, so to speak. <laughs> thought I would show you something a little different than my normal picture in the corner of the screen. I thought, okay, I'll be down here at the bottom. So we'll uh, give this a second and uh, we'll see if everything is working. Everyone can hear me okay. I think I've got the volume maxed out too high. I'm gonna turn that down a little bit. We are in my new office and uh, today we're gonna be talking about frozen food and we're also gonna talk about um, protecting the wall behind your aquarium from damage. My friend came up with a really cool solution and I wanted to uh, share it with you guys because I thought, man, this is so, it came out so clean. So I've got some pictures to share with you and I've got some other uh, things to talk about. But I thought first I could show you the behind the scenes of what is going on in this room. Let's see if that works. Okay, cool. <laughs> I see a lot of people saying hello, that's a good sign. I'm assuming audio is gonna be loud enough this week. And if I got it wrong, turn up your microphone. I mean your, your AirPods, your, your earphones, your volume. So <laughs> Bill says not first. Okay, so first of all, what I wanna do, I wanna switch cameras. Let me just make a new scene. And I want to, <laughs> I'm assuming you're just looking at the new screen. That's not what I want to do here. Let's do this. Let's try this one. There we go. All right, so <laughs> the new office. Oh, I didn't make it big enough. Hang on, let me make that full screen. Full screen, hang on, one second, one second, one second. There we go. Perfect. All right, so I'm walking around. There's the reef tank down there, which I assume you can see. And then in here is my green screen, which I've had for many years, but I've never used the tripod apparatus to hold it up. And then I've got some lighting. I've got my new curtains up and got a light down there. Got the green screen right there. And then here is what I look at when I'm talking to you guys. I just look at a Nikon lens. All right, so that's it. Let me switch back to where we were. I think it was this one. And that is not correct. What happened? We had it going so well. Oh, hang on, I gotta hit play. No, it was this one. That's why I can't fig figure it out. Man, when I break something, I really break it. Okay, there's that. So where am I? <laughs> oh, that's why. Here we go. So sorry about that. All right, that looks more decent. Go a little bit bigger. All right, so now we are kind of current. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to show that to you guys. I thought it'd be kind of fun just for a slight change of pace. And uh, I see AJ is here. He's already sent a super chat because he says that wall protector is awesome. Well, it is his wall protector. So he came to see if I had to say nice things about him or not on the live stream. Let me uh, move that up. Put that back. I want to do, I'm going to put him on the screen one more time because he's hiding. Oh, I can't do it. Let's do this. We'll put it up here. We'll put me right here. That looks good. All right. I like that better. <laughs> cool. I'm not gonna say the obvious joke there. I'm just gonna leave it for, for now. So talking about frozen food, this is a really quick topic, but there was an interesting, <clears throat> an interesting thing that came up from a friend of mine who I said, hey, I wanna get you on the live stream again. And she said, what would you talk with me about? I have nothing good to say. And I was just thinking that's so strange for you to say that. And then, you know, I said, you know, I don't know, we can talk about anything. We talk about food or whatever. And then she said, should I say her name? <laughs> She said, I would tell all of your audience to throw away their frozen food after three months. And I said, well, that's crazy talk. I buy like a year supply and fill my freezer with frozen food from my aquarium. I would never throw it away after three months. And her reply was that, the f that most people put the food in the door of the freezer and they open and close that door all the time. And the food is not hard, hard frozen. It's kind of a little thawed and it's spoiling because it's constantly being... Uh, exposed to the warm temperature of the room 
as you open and look for things in the freezer or you open to get ice or you open to just stare at which flavor of ice cream you want. And I was like, okay, valid point. I actually don't put mine in the door. I put mine deep in the freezer and I have it toward the back of the freezer where it is rock hard at all times. And usually it's actually hard to break apart when I take it out of the freezer because it's so solid. And she said, well, okay, that's different. You're different. And I was like, okay, fair enough. So I don't know where you store your frozen food, but here's a couple of tips I want to give you. Number one, if you have a stash, a decent amount, the first thing you can do is wrap it in another bag and then put that in the back of your freezer. Now you could use just the grocery bag it came in, you could use the freezer Ziploc bags, but basically you're creating an extra vapor barrier to uh, maintain the temperature so it isn't getting exposed to opening the door and letting warm air rush in, and then you close it and it cools down again. So that would be my first thing. Wrap, double wrap it, and then put it in the back of the freezer, and instead of accessible, right there in the front where it's so convenient. So in my case, I have an ice maker, and above it there's a tray, and I put all the frozen food up there, and I push it toward the back. And I, like I said, I have no issues with mine ever going bad. And then I have a whole bunch of Rod's food in my freezer below the ice maker in the back. And then I put everything in front of it that I care about that I'm going to eat, whether it's vegetables or bagels or whatever I've frozen. But the stuff that's in there has been hard frozen and there's no um, concern about it going bad. So if you are a person that is, you know, think about where you store the food and possibly move it to a better area in your freezer so that way it'll last longer and it won't be something you have to throw away after three months. Now, I don't know if you would throw it away after three months, but she thinks you should. <laughs> and I'm just not gonna say her name today, but it's one of many of my friends that are women. So good luck figuring that out. Now, another thing I wanna tell you, another helpful tip when it comes to frozen food, because invariably I see these posts online where people will say, oh my God, I left the food out overnight and is it still usable? And I always say no. I mean, if it's been sitting on the counter all night and into the morning until you finally stumble on it, throw it away. It's too late. You've blown it. You wasted some money. That's just my recommendation. I would not put it in my aquarium after that. And uh, that's that. But what I would tell you to do is whenever you take frozen food out of your freezer, as soon as you are done taking the portions you are going to use, put it back in the freezer before you feed your tank. And if that is your every single time routine, you'll never leave it on the counter to accidentally melt. And this has been my method for, for many years. I, I was thinking I've never actually mentioned that on the show. <laughs> so I just figured I'd help you with that helpful tip. And uh, I hope that it saves you some money in the long run and uh, you won't have a, a horrific accident where you've wasted some food and the fish stores are closed for several days because of whatever, holidays or whatever, and you aren't able to get more immediately to take care of your babies. Now, if you have... Um, refrigerated foods again you might want to put them in the door of the refrigerator but it might be better to put them toward the back of the fridge because again there it's a colder area toward the back and especially lower down in the fridge than it is up high so these are some thoughts when it comes to food that i wanted to share with you and that was super easy and quick now our next topic if i can get this thing to cooperate i wanted to show you what my friend did behind his aquarium well, actually, I'm going to talk about it first, and then I'll show you. How about that? So, um, I think we need a new scene again. <laughs> because I'm going to be putting these things up on the screen. Actually, let me just... What can I do here? Let me try this. Maybe I'll get away with this. And now I can make a new scene, and you don't see it, possibly. Ha! It worked. All right, great. And then I will throw this on there. When it comes to having an aquarium in front of a wall, you may accidentally um, damage the, the sheetrock behind your aquarium, or it could be wood paneling. It could be you know, a number of different uh, products that have been used as your decor. And so you, know, you just find the perfect spot for your aquarium. What is my aquarium? I mean, what is my computer doing? It does not want to do what I'm asking it to do. All right, got the first one. Jeez, that was hard, hard work. <clears throat> and so what I would say is to move the aquarium away from the wall a few inches, and that way you can protect it from spatter 
from the back of the aquarium, hitting the wall and slowly chewing away the sheetrock. I've had a, I've got a friend uh, that lived in Pennsylvania, and he lived in a rent house, and his aquarium was against the wall forever. And when he moved out, that wall just I'd never seen such damaged sheetrock in my life. Now, granted, it was a rundown place, but it looked awful. It looked like replace that wall entirely. You couldn't do anything to fix the surface. And I'm sure the landlord wasn't happy either. So uh, I would recommend that you do what you can to protect the property, whether it's your own or your renter, because you don't want to pay for a big expensive, uh, or you lose your deposit or have to pay even more in damages because you had an aquarium. And we're not even talking about water on the floor. <laughs> we're talking about water on the wall, spatter on the wall. And this could come from just the way the tank is draining down into the sump. It could be actually how it's draining the sump and spattering out the back and hitting the wall down low. It could be protein skimmers overflowing. It could be hang on back filters and skimmers that are dumping stuff all over the place and creating spatter that is slowly eating away at the wall that was there. So what I would really like to recommend is that you put up some kind of protection. Now, there are different products on the market, and I've suggested something as simple as the drawer uh, vinyl liner that you glue in the bottom of the drawer. You know how people do that a lot of times when they move into a new place, they put down vinyl. You can get a clear vinyl and put that on the wall. That's something you can peel off later. It might peel off some of the paint, but the wall won't be destroyed, and you can always have another coat of paint and you know, look like it never happened. Um, but if you don't like that look, another choice I saw when I was at Ikea was you could get acrylic panels that were a certain size, kind of looked like the size of a placemat, and they came with four little holes and four little screws, and you would screw them on the wall. And ideally, these were designed for like a backsplash in a kitchen, but the same thing could be, work, could be attached to the wall behind the aquarium to create this water guard from actually hitting the wall itself, and just you could wipe off the acrylic all day long. And again, clear acrylic, it just would kind of look like a shiny spot, but it would be a clean spot, and that would work. Then, um, when I suggested this to my friend AJ, he said that he tried the contact paper stuff, and it didn't hold. <clears throat> and he didn't like the look either. It looked kind of crappy. So I said, okay, fair enough. And then there's something on the market that's called FRP. And these are oftentimes used inside um, uh, places where they serve food. They'll have it in the kitchens, they might have it inside freezers, and it is a type of hard plastic material that has a texture to it, and it, it's either attached to the wall with glue, or it can be held in place with tracks or you know, some, some screws, I guess. But the principle is you can completely wipe it down. If anything hits it, you just, it just runs down the wall. It doesn't damage the sheetrock behind it or the woodwork. So FRP is another choice, but it might be an eyesore. It might not look right. We don't need to cover the entire wall, but we want to definitely cover the areas that could get wet. So if you have a spot along the top of the tank, you want to cover that. That makes sense. And then perhaps the area behind the sump, especially if the sump fills the stand and is pretty close to the wall as well. So here is the first picture I want to share with you. Let me see which one I like. I think I like this one. So here's what my friend AJ did. He put up black ABS that he I forget where he said he bought it, but it might have been something like a Home Depot or Lowe's scenario. And he mounted to the wall, and it actually hangs down about a solid foot below the aquarium. So it's not just that little area, it's actually going down even further. But what he did, which was really neat, was he affixed it to the wall with these little standoffs. And these are designed for like having floating picture frames on your wall. And you can get these standoffs from Amazon. So his uh, ABS is actually sticking off the sheetrock about an inch. And so he can reach behind it and uh, run things down there, such as some cords. Let's see if I have that picture here, too. I thought I did. Nope, I'll have to show you the video. All right, so I'll get you one more here. I believe it is moving over. So you can see the panel is there, and it's actually the same height as the lights. So it kind of looks like it all goes together. All right. And then I've got another one to show you here. Wait. 
don't think you saw any of that. Did you see that? I saw it. <laughs> Hang on. I might have got it incorrect. All right, let me go back to this one again. Oh, I think I see what I did wrong. All right, back to live mode. I hear my dog going crazy. <clears throat> That's why I closed the door. So you see how the panel lines up with the lights so nicely? And this right here just looks super clean, especially from a distance. So here you can see it again from a distance. And then I want to show you this other video. I think it was this one. So you see right here, he's got the wires from the sky going down behind the panel. So it sort of looks like the lights have no power cords, which again, hid it beautifully. And that's what makes this whole setup look so clean. And it also helps to keep the lights nice and level because you've got the cables hanging down, but the power cord usually pulls on it a little bit and you're messing with the cord trying to get it adjusted. So instead he was able to use the ABS as a way to support the cord and support the light and hide the cord and just make it look really, really good. So I wanted to show you that. And I hope that you guys liked that little tour. If you were listening to this show, you don't know what you're missing. I've got one more here to show you. I'm gonna drag it up here. And we're gonna do this. So this is a newly set up Planet Aquarium. I believe he said it was 105 gallons. And it's, um, you know, it just got some new fish added just recently. But the setup looks fantastic. It just came out really, really good. And it's got webcams. <laughs> you can see it from anywhere. So there you guys go. I hope you liked that. All right. Where'd I go? Now I'm gone again. <sighs> See if we can figure out what happened here. Why do things not just stay? Oh, let me try this. Ta-da! I'm back. I'm back. All right. Let me see. Um, <clears throat> this thing is acting really weird today. It's like doing its own show. <laughs> it's not working with me at, at all. <clears throat> Close this. So I guess I need to ask, did that work for you guys or not? OK, good. Someone says it looks clean. <laughs> That's a good sign. I'm looking at the chat. I'm like, oh, what is happening? Um, yeah, it was doing some weird preview mode. And then when I did it, I thought it would just show it. But it then says publish. I'm like, we're already live. Give it some time. I'll be back in a moment. Oh my goodness, it is just like, I, I just want to start over. <laughs> Back to live mode. That's what I want for this. OK, I think this will work. Kevin, did that last video show you the power cords? I'll go to this one again and hide myself because I'm totally in the way. Oh, that was the photograph. Is it this one? There's where the cords are. Ugh, turn that off. Why is it putting on background noise? Oh my goodness, it's like this whole software has just forgotten how I operate my show every week. <laughs> it's not being nice. And it's not remembering settings as I pick. All right, so now you saw where the power cords are. They come out the back corner of the light or the back side of the light and feeds right in. Okay. All 
and I'm back again. All right. So uh, I, I feel like I totally botched that. <laughs> and I really wanted to wow you. So <laughs> uh, the perks of working with live stream, right? But uh, it is what it is. You know, I did the best I could here. Sorry, AJ. All right, Thomas says that he keeps the food in the back of his freezer in a bag uh, and stores it in a freezer bag as well. And uh, several people are saying, here Lucas said, I buy a three month supply at a time. It comes in a little box. I have all the fish food frozen in its own drawer. It's a large fridge size freezer. And then Paul says, salt creep destroys radiators as well. All right. Let's see. I feel like I messed up, guys. I apologize. I thought it was going to work. I thought I was seeing what I was seeing. I'm watching it happen, and you're not seeing anything. The perks of live stream drives me crazy. All right, so why don't we answer some of your questions today? I feel like this is going to be a short show because <laughs> I'm so uncomfortable. I don't like it when things don't go the way I planned it. I had this master plan. So uh, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. I answer them. In the meantime, I will remind you that today is water test Saturday. Please do test your water in your aquarium. I have to go test two tanks today, my reef and, of course, Caitlin's reef, because I got a new product I'm going to be dosing into her tank, and I want to know where all my parameters are. So I treated the tank for cyano this week, and it's time for the water change, and then put some carbon in the, in the little filter I have in the back and let it just kind of purify the water. And that will take care of that and then just measure my parameters and see what my tank needs uh, to, you know, get the calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, all those things where they need to be. So we'll find out. But I have this new product I want to try out. It was sent to me and I'm going to give it a shot and see what it does. And then on the big reef, um, I need to clean the algae turf scrubber and um, adjust the protein skimmer slightly to be a little bit wetter. After that, I would... Uh, say that my tank has been pretty seamless all week long. I haven't had any real surprises. I did change the reagents on my Trident, and I had a momentary heart attack when it said that my alkalinity was not 8 point something. It was 13.45, but by the end of the testing period, it was right back at 8 point something. <laughs> so it was like a hiccup, but the, you know, the spike was like, oh my goodness, so it's been telling me the incorrect number for who knows how long, but it's self-corrected. So I actually wonder if maybe the Trident will then retest itself. Like if it gets a weird number it's not used to, does it check two, three times and then give you the result? Because at the end of the testing period, it actually said it was the right number again and I was right on track. So I was very happy for that. Will says, any recommendations for acclimating a bull tip anemone? Uh, they're pretty simple to add. They aren't complicated at all. Usually it's just a matter of floating the bag that the anemone is in to get the same temperature as your aquarium. And then at that point, you could double check salinity. And if it's close enough to your tank, you could just put it in the tank. I know a lot of people these days have been putting their brand new anemones in Seapro, in some kind of a Seapro bath. I've never done that. I don't even know where to buy that stuff. <laughs> I don't know where to get the prescription to buy that stuff. I mean, some kind of a vet would have to do it probably. But then it's supposed to help to make sure they, they stay healthy. Uh, for me, I've never had a problem with, it, with one. I get a bubble tip. I put it in my tank, and then I had more, <laughs> and that was it. I mean, there was no real surprises. I bought sea bay, you know, the sea bay I've had now for, in the main reef for probably seven or eight years, and it again, it didn't get sea pro, and uh, aptasia grow like crazy, and mahanos grow like crazy, and my copper band helps to keep those under control. So that has just been the the situation. <clears throat> David says, help with acropora bugs. Do they harm the coral and what to do about them? Well, it depends which ones you're talking about. If you're talking about the, uh, the red bugs, those things definitely harm the acros. If you're talking about amphipods and copepods, not so much. If it's acropora eating flatworms, that, that's definitely a problem. So there's different creatures that can affect our systems. And recently, Joe Aiolo was sharing on Facebook he has these really white amphipods, and they, they don't just run, they jump. I mean, they're like fleas as they leap all over the coral super fast. And he shared some video footage of it. Doesn't even know what they're called. He calls them them. 
and uh, they were a nightmare in his tank, and they were just destroying corals. Colonies of Pacillopora and other Acropora were suffering badly, and so finally he got himself a ton of Interceptor and treated a 20,000-gallon reef <laughs> and got rid of them. It, it, it worked. He killed them all off, and now his corals can breathe and, and heal, and he was even showing before and after pictures. So very interesting. It's a new parasite. He always seems to find the best parasites, and somehow they got into his re, uh, newly reset up reef that he set up about a year ago. So they came in on something, and that's not great, but it is just one of those situations where you have to just uh, figure out what's the solution, apply the solution, and then deal with the recovery of the reef tank. And, you know, like I've said in the past, when something really goes wrong in your tank, when you solve it, it's going to probably be three months till you get back to where you were. And I'm sure that he's probably thinking that exact same situation right now. Uh, Kevin says, is there a go-to way of checking overall nutrient saturation levels or, or if they're too low as well? You know, if you are feeding your tank heavily, like I do, you will tend to always have nitrate and phosphate in the water. And that is an indication of the nutrients. If you are measuring almost none, then either there's not enough food in the water, there's not enough fish waste in the water, and so you have a lack of nutrients, or your system is so uh, so well set up that it's catching everything before it can break down and become nutrients. In other words, you put the food in the water, and it immediately goes down the drain, gets caught in a filter sock or a fleece roller. You got a protein skimmer, you've got this, you got that, and you got all these things, and it's stripping the tank clean, and it never gets a chance to get quote unquote dirty. So we want to make sure that we are using the right amount of filtration for the current bio load right now, rather than trying to turn on every bell and whistle because you're scared of what nutrients could possibly do. Because what are they going to do? What's the worst thing nutrients are going to do? They'll grow some algae. And algae we can get rid of. So I would be shooting for nitrate under 20 and phosphate under 0.1. And if you can have your number somewhere around that range, you'll probably be just fine. But if you're measuring like 0.1, 0.5 of a nitrate ppm or your 0.01 or 0 0.00 of phosphate you're just too low in nutrients and you need more in the tank that's why products came to market like brightwell selling neo nitro and neo Phos because they wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to just pour these items in to raise the nitrate and phosphate level enough that you don't end up with dinoflagellates Santana Reef, thank you for the feedback on the microphone. I will continue to see what I can do to get it just right. I might have to do some off-air practices. I was actually listening through my AirPod, and it seemed low that way too, but I, I thought maybe the AirPod was doing some filtering. But I would love to get it just right. Lucas says, are there any tips for copper van butterflies? I should get one this week. 15 gallon quarantine with live rock and got 42 grams of easy reef mastic uh, the mastic could be a good solution black worms would be ideal because they're living and copper vans love black worms if you can get live ones uh, i have used frozen blood worms in the past and that worked as well uh, interestingly i did not know this until i was reading the package and i just thought how crazy is this and i mentioned it uh, on social media and people are like, oh yeah, I, I have an allergic reaction to frozen red blood worms. And I thought, I mean, because it says on the package, wash your hands and, and be careful and it's possible you get sick. And I thought, I have been opening these things up and rinsing my fingers and I had no issue whatsoever. I, I didn't know it bothered anyone. So if you are getting frozen blood worms, then you want to just be a little extra careful with that. John says, do I need a circulating dosing pump for Kalkwasser, or can I use the, D the DD single dose pump? Um, that's a good question for Chris Meckley. I believe, I mean, I'm not a Kalkwasser user. And I know that uh, Randy Holmes Farley, who told us about Kalkwasser so many years ago, back in the early 2000s, he said how he would mix up 45 gallons of Kalkwasser once a month and then that would be topped off into his tank. And he just made it sound like he mixed it up and that was it. And then he just trickled in the liquid as needed for 30 days. He didn't say anything about having to re-stir it or remix it or put a pump in there that mixes it for five minutes a day. He didn't mention anything. So I don't know 
if it's really necessary to cascade it from time to time. Now, I know there are different methods of using Kalkwasser, including Kalkwasser reactors. There are people that use magnetic stirrers that stir it up once an hour. But essentially, we don't want the white milk to go into the tank. I saw one guy that completely made like a DIY Kalkwasser thing with a magnetic stirrer on one side, but it had baffle, baffle, baffle. And then by the time it got to the fourth baffle, it was clear water. So he was stirring and that was white and smoky, but the next level was less and then finally it was opaque and then finally it was clear and he was sending the clear water into his tank. Uh, according to Chris, you want to have a pH, I believe he said of 12.44. So if you've got it to 12.44, it's saturated. I mean, that's it. You can't, I don't think you can go higher than that number. I think that is your super saturation point that you're aiming for. And according to him, if you've hit that level, it cannot dissolve anymore. There's nothing left to dissolve. So I would think that either you use too much of the powder, and so you still have some left over, because he made it sound like his containers were pretty clean at the bottom, not that he had a, an epic amount of sediment. There was some, but most of it fully, you know, most of it dissolved. And so in that case, you know, he just has large containers of this stuff that tops off his tanks, and then he replenishes them from time to time. But he didn't mention anything about stirring them up when we did our two-hour live stream. Uh, Josh says, "How do? what's the best way to catch a Melanurus wrasse if you don't have a fish trap? I thought of trying a DIY one, and I thought it might be worth a shot. Uh, and it's been chewing off half of his, my, his male liar tail's tail. Aw. Um, you could try to section off the tank, like put some kind of divider in the tank. You might have to rearrange your rock a little bit to pull that off, but you can kind of shrink the territory the wrasse has to escape. Uh, my simplest solution is always pump out all the water of the tank to leave you about this much water in the base and then scoop out the fish in question and then refill the tank. It takes about 20 minutes for the entire process and you get the fish out. And that's if you don't have a fish trap and you're just going to use a couple of nets and you're going to kind of corral it. Now the Melanurus wrasse, I believe, is one that likes to hide in the rocks. So I would think that lowering the water level would be ideal. I don't think it's going to try to retreat into a rock as if the water's just getting lower from like what looks like a water change, it might just get swim around lower and lower and won't have a chance to dart into its favorite hole. So that would be the method I would suggest. Aliens said, I accidentally broke a fragment of my Monty today and there are white flesh strands everywhere. Will it recover? Yeah, um, the Monty is a super brittle coral and it just, it snaps off. Now you could either take the piece that broke off and put it back inside the colony, or you can take the piece that broke off and you can plant it somewhere else in your rock work and just keep your hands off of it and it should continue to heal and it will grow and the original colony will grow and all will be well. Montipore are a really super easy coral for most hobbyists. Alex says, can certain fish food add impurities such as copper? Um, the, the ocean actually has a trace amount of copper, just an itty bitty tiny amount. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but a little tiny copper is present at all times in the ocean, so that wouldn't be harmful. But if you had some kind of food that just really gave off a lot of copper, I would stop using that one and look for a different one that doesn't. That's kind of an interesting question. I'm wondering how you came across that and uh, what food it was that you were concerned about. Uh, Lucas says, I feed heavy. I have heavy import and export system. The filter floss, the skimmer, the refugium. I'm dosing live phytoplankton four times a day. My nitrate is 1 to 3 ppm. My phosphate's around 0 0.03. Well, those are super low numbers, and with those numbers, it's still okay. And in theory, you should be growing some beautiful SPS because that was the number we used to shoot for in the uh, 2000 to 2010. That was the number. <laughs> Vivek says, bare bottom versus reef with sand, not a deep sand bed. Which is better? If we go with a deep sand bed, what inverts are required to maintain a clean sand bed? First of all, um, any kind of sand is better than no sand at all. And that's my personal opinion, and I'm right, and everyone else is wrong. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. But uh, I do really believe that an aquarium looks best with sand in the bottom. I find that tanks that are bare bottom, they still have detritus and the detritus is still blowing around and you have to constantly keep cleaning to remove that from the tank if it, if it bothers you. If you don't care about that detritus and it's just creating little puddles of brown here and there and you occasionally siphon it out, well, that's just basically how you are doing your hobby, just like anyone doing anything themselves. I would think that it, it would be ideal if you could um, use some sand, even if it's just a half an inch, just enough to cover the glass. That half inch will not be this massive nutrient sink. It's not going to cause chaos for your tank. It'll just look better. But there are people out there that just hate when their sand gets dirty and they just don't want any sand at all. There was a guy, his name was Steve Wiest, and he had a beautiful tank of the month quality reef. It was tank of the month. And it was just fantastic. And we learned through one of the articles talking about his aquarium that he put in one bag of sand and that was the sand you saw in the, in, in the pictures. And he put in one bag every single month. <laughs> that was it. So his aquascape was, the tank I believe was four feet wide and it went back seven feet. So it was a big aquarium, but you could only see it from the four foot panel. You couldn't see it from the sides because that was in the garage. And he had his rock work coming toward you know, the, the back wall. So you saw the reef growing like this and there was a sliver of sand. And he had power heads at the bottom or he had closed loop that was pushing the water toward the center at all times inside the aquarium. And so what it was doing is it was pushing the sand to the middle so you always had this little trail of sand, like a path when you're walking through a forest and you, just, you can just see the trail, you know where you're walking. Well, he would just siphon out that bag of sand every month and put in a brand new bag. And that was his thing, and his tank always looked amazing. Everything about his system was amazing. His sump was always pristine. It was crazy clean. But it didn't really cost him much. I mean, it was a bag of sand, whatever that costs. And just once a month, he put in a new bag, and then he siphoned out the old. And uh, he didn't rewash the sand and use it twice. I thought that was interesting. For me, I would have washed it out I mean, if I was going to do this swapping system. But in my own reef, you can see in the video right now, the sand is not bad. It's, uh, it's not pristine, but it's not covered in brown. It's not covered in algae. It, it's just sand in an aquarium. <laughs> and you know, when I go in there from time to time and I use a gravel vac, I suck out some of the brown detritus that's got trapped in it. But like I was saying, with a half inch sand bed, or even just a one inch sand bed, you're not gonna get much waste trapped in it and you can siphon that out, just like I do in Caitlin's Reef. I siphon out the sand bed and that's it. It's, I'm done with it and uh, all is well. Now, if you wanna run a deep sand bed and you don't wanna touch the sand bed at all, then you're gonna want cucumbers and you're gonna want fighting or sand conks. You're going to want serpent starfish. You are gonna want some hermit crabs. These are all things that stir up the sand and travel through and above it. And you're not having to mess with it, but it will take care of itself. My buddy Dwayne likes to take a turkey baster and he likes to puff the sand bed in his reef tank. I've never done that, but he, he's a big, you know, big fan of that. He recommends it highly. So if you want to like just squirt at the sand bed to kind of like kick up the dust so the dust can exit into your protein skimmer or filter socks, you could do that as another type of maintenance to kind of help keep your numbers in check. Fairly Odd says, last week I finally finished watching every single live stream on your channel. It took me greater part of six months. Love me some me left. Well, that is amazing. That is a ton of video. And I almost feel badly because I know you probably heard me repeat things repeatedly. Uh, because I do bring up things that have happened in the past every so often. And you just went through this binge, like a Netflix binge. <laughs> and you heard the same stories over and over. I apologize for that. But I am glad that you enjoyed it enough that you, you stuck through. I mean, wow. That's amazing. I need to send you a Mila's Reef uh, glass or mug. You should contact me. Send me an email, sales at milosreef.com. We'll talk. Lucas says, uh, oh, he was talking to Josh. He says that he spooked the grass, but he saw where it, where it was buried. I'm surprised that, I thought the Melanurus didn't live in the sand. I thought the, you know, because I had a Melanurus, and I was almost positive it always lived in, I mean, it slept in the rock work. But other wrasses, there are some wrasses that sleep in the sand, and there are some that do not. David says, what would cause a lobo to recede? 
Oh, a couple things. It could be the water quality is not good. It could be there's too much flow. It could be it's not getting enough food. It could be a fish is nipping at it. You almost need to kind of like stand back in a dark room, just observe your tank and see what's happening and see if there's anything obvious. It could even be something like peppermint shrimp are picking at it and stealing the food. And so the lobo is just not getting enough food, you know, ingested into its system before the shrimp steals it. And I have literally protected lobos in the past by covering them with a dome. And then after I couldn't see the food, and it took like 45 minutes for the food to quietly go into the mouth. And then I took the dome off and the shrimp ran over and reached down inside the, the mouth like Santa reaching to his bag of toys and pulled the food out and ran away. I couldn't believe it. And I was so mad because I had to refeed it all over again. Uh, SBA Zane says, how much light does the Monty need? Mine is not that dark red. Uh, they don't need a lot of light. Monty Pora, uh, <laughs> that's the way I'm saying it, Monty. Montipora don't need a lot of light. They actually can live perfectly well up high or down low in the tank. They can be in corners. They are just a super easy coral. The coloration of the coral could come down to, again, available nutrients, uh, light intensity. These are the, the two that come to mind. Of course, it could be a lack of a certain trace element too. And by replenishing what's lacking, which number one, I always say uh, magnesium. Always keep your magnesium at 1400 for Montipora. It could be potassium is low. Your tank might be measuring 360 when it needs to be 400 to 420. So those two right there could actually make a Montipora look better. Alex says, what are your thoughts on black sand? Have you ever tried using black sand? No, I haven't. The reason <clears throat> I don't use black sand is it's not sand at all. It's, uh, well, <laughs> we call it sand, but it's actually glass. The, there's no such thing as black sand. It's silica. It's completely glass. It's tiny microscopic glass beads, and it just looks dirty. You know, I've seen people mix white and black sand together to get that salt and pepper look because they're trying to hide the uh, detritus that's gathering on it or in it, and it just it it just doesn't work out long term. And if it was a really good idea, you would see lots of people adopting it because they would say, oh, "My corals just pop against the black. I love it." But you just you only see a few people doing it. There's no buffering benefit from black sand like there is with aragonite, which is calcium carbonate. It's calcium-based sand. And so that's why we so often use aragonite sand for our aquariums. The black stuff is not. Uh, David says, I'm growing ketomorpha, and my nitrate is still at 95, will not drop even with 50% water change. I checked it with different kits. A 50% water change should have cut your nitrate in half. So I'm going to wonder what is going on with the different kits. They're all measuring 95. What brand of kits are you using? Can you let me know? Uh, I can tell you that Nitrate R, which is a product I sell on my website, will pull nitrate out of your tank. But it's super buoyant. It needs to be in a reactor mainly. That would be my best recommendation. You could put it in a mesh bag and shove it in the corner of the sump, but it's not going to be nearly as a, it's going to be passive versus active. And so it, it won't work quite as well. But uh, that would be another method to get nitrate out of your system. Uh, Thomas says, my green brain coral is turning brown. What can I do? Well, I'll post a picture of it in Club Milo's Reef so we can see it. Uh, it could be that it's not getting enough light. It could be that the, uh, I, I know you test your water all the time, and I'm trying to remember your last number results. I don't think they were that far off. Uh, how long have you had it? Tall's here. He says, I just made food yesterday. I'll have to watch from the beginning when it's over. <laughs> and then IAK Daddy Barbecue says, I just finished watching your fire pit video. And it came out amazing. Thank you. I actually enjoy it. I'm doing a, a fire tomorrow. I just bought something from Amazon that I saw <clears throat> videos of. It's this metal thing, and you put your log on top, and you hit it with a small sledgehammer, and it splits the wood to give you smaller pieces of kindling. Because I've been going from twigs to logs, and so I needed that intermediary. And I saw the thing, and I wanted to buy it months ago. Finally pulled the trigger and bought it, and I'm going to be using it tomorrow to start up a nice fire. And I can't wait. Thanks, Luca. 
He says the Melanurus rats like all of the other Heliochorus and uh, is that the right way to say that? <laughs> rats is bury, but others like the six line and the fairy go inside the rock. The fairy go inside the rock work. Okay, yeah, I didn't think the Melanurus was a sand dweller for some reason. Imagine that. Well, it was in a giant tank. I didn't actually watch it go to bed. I did watch my uh, yellow chorus go in. And that thing, I mean, it did in my 29 gallon, it did in the 280, it did in the 400, and it would like circle the sand bed the second the light was turning off. I mean, just like the light went off and the rats went in the sand at the exact same moment. It just knew the exact moment. It was so amazing how it just knew what time it was. Uh, Vivek says, how do you keep both softies and SPS in the same tank with super low nutrients? Any additional things to dose as my softies won't grow at all? Well, you're combining completely different creatures into an aquarium that have completely different needs. So one thing's going to do great and the other thing's not going to do well. Or both of them are going to be kind of eh because neither one's happy. Or one's just going to die and the other one, well, again, we're back to and one does super well. I uh, do combine, I've been running mixed reefs for many years, and I just kind of find the middle ground. I, you know, I put in enough food for everything. Your softies might need you to put in something like phytoplankton, rotifers, uh, different types of uh, powdered foods that were mixed in water and then poured in the tank, and leave the skimmer off for an hour or so. And then, you know, once that hour has elapsed, then run it through filter socks and fleece rollers and protein skimming and all that kind of stuff. But the SPS and the other end of the spectrum, they're not going to be happy that they're getting hit with all this stuff necessarily. So you have to kind of have to choose what you want to keep rather than trying to combine them both. It might be better just have a softy tank and have an SPS tank, and you can have both worlds, one with low nutrients and one with higher nutrients. Think about the non-photosynthetic tanks, those corals that don't care about light whatsoever and, and could live in complete darkness because they completely live off the food that they ingest. Those corals, their water almost never looks clear. It always looks kind of muddy because there's so much food in the water at all times. But they grow and they make more of themselves, and you end up with a tank full of coral that's really impressive and, uh, and nice to share. But for me, I would prefer looking at all those beautiful non-photosynthetic corals in clear water if I could. And that's why I remember visiting someone who was basically dosing phytoplankton in small amounts all day long so his water always had a little bit of a green hue to it and i said man if you could do this but not have the green hue i would do it too and he said he just said it's not going to happen <laughs> now i'm not saying it's impossible but there would be a challenge all right um <clears throat> Let's see. Any more questions? This is your chance. I'm trying to think about any other reef news to share with you from this week, and I don't have much coming to mind. I um, didn't do anything with a tank. I can tell you right now in the video, there's a yellow tang looking at that little anemone, and it's right above a maize coral, and that anemone is stinging my maize coral because I have been so lax about reaching in and removing that little offender. But I've got a skunk clownfish that's been hanging out in that exact anemone. Now, it doesn't mean it won't be okay somewhere else, but I almost feel bad stealing its little home. So I've been trying to, uh, trying to excuse my laziness <laughs> when I really shouldn't. Let's see. David says, what's wrong with the left-hand side of your tank? Your fish don't seem to like it. Yeah, they, they like the right side of the tank. I think they like it because that's where the food is. You know, it's where I pour the food in. Even though I do pour in the food on the other end. In the, so what happens is I walk up to the back of the tank. The return pump is off. And I feed all the clownfish and the anemones in the temporary tank. And then I pour food in that area right there in the back. And, of course, the vortex just blows it to the right end of the tank. And then I pour the rest of the food in the right end so that the hammers and the Duncans and and the sea bay and all those can get a meal too. And so it ends up the food goes everywhere and it just looks like a rainstorm in the tank. But technically the food does start on the left end. But yeah, you don't see a lot of fish over there. Occasionally you'll see an atheist over there or you'll see the tanks kind of swimming under the acros, but there is not a lot of activity over there. 
John says, how often and how many, <laughs> how much water change do you do? I don't do them enough. I want to do more this year. Um, I believe it was a month ago, maybe maybe longer, maybe six weeks ago, I changed about 100 gallons. And, you know, the tank's 450 gallons total. So it wasn't a big water change. General rule of thumb has always been change 25% of your water once a month. I change more water in Caitlin's Reef than I do in my main reef because of, uh, it. I don't know, it, it seems easier on the smaller tank. I don't really want to drain down the tank and expose the corals to air. I don't really like doing that. So I tend to pump the water out of the sump. It's just, it's kind of a hassle factor. And I've had, you know, quite a few people say, why don't you just set up automated water changes and then you don't have to think about it. But there's still more things to think about. And I have other projects to do with anyway. But nope, I don't do a lot of water changes. I think last year I probably did five out of the whole year, possibly six times, or probably more like five times. And uh, I just dose trace elements that are lacking to replace what's missing. And when I dose those trace elements, I completely can see the difference in my coral growth and coloration. Uh, Huang says, when a coral recedes, like a brain coral, how long would it take to recover or even recover? Depends how much it's receding. Um, but usually feeding it regularly, like s several times a week, can really help give the coral a fighting chance to recover. As long as nothing's picking at it and constantly causing it more chaos. If you have fish nibbling on the flesh, you know, because they are constantly, uh, you know, maybe they're eating what's some of the die off maybe they're eating some of the living but they aren't necessarily trying to kill the coral outright they're just kind of opportunistic like oh there's something to nibble on and then the coral's like oh i'm already in a bad spot and you're messing with me so it could take some time to recover but it shouldn't be um something that uh you'll have to write up as a loss it just depends it, you know i'm sorry i can't just give you an absolute answer you'd think they would just like yes or no it's black or white it's not there are chances where if any bit of life survives, it can grow into another coral. That's the beauty of corals. I love that about corals. But if you have a coral that is receding, sometimes you can see it recede and it will just dwindle away and there's nothing you can do, but everything else in your aquarium is doing completely fine. And if that's the case, I usually just accept that that one didn't make it. I don't sit there and try and fight tooth and nail to save this one coral to the point of causing chaos with all the other corals. You know, it's, I don't know what's happening with this coral necessarily. I had this one I bought. I remember I saw it. It was beautiful. It was so pretty. I was basically telling the fish store owner, I don't care what it costs. Put it in a bag. I'm taking it. And then he, he gave me the receipt, you know, and said, give me your credit card. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> it, was, it was really expensive. And I had that coral for about a year and a half, almost two years. And it was beautiful the whole time. And then finally, it just started to recede, and when it did, it just it just receded down to nothing and was gone. And I never found out what killed it. I remember calling the store owner saying, do you have any recommendations? And he said, oh, you know what you're doing. You'll be fine. It'll be fine. And I was like, mm, I don't think it's fine at all. And, of course, I was right. And then I saved it as a paperweight because it was pretty expensive. <laughs> but eventually, I had to get rid of it because it was just too much of a reminder of what I used to have. Eric says, when you dose phosphate or Rex uh, to drop your phosphate, do you use a 10 micron sock? I almost never do. Uh, for, you know, when that product came out, there was no 10 micron sock available. We had 200 micron, maybe 100 micron. And then after about, I don't know, eight or nine years of using that product, Blue Life USA announced, we have 10 micron socks now, which I do sell on my website. And they say, we absolutely recommend you use this with the Phosphator X. It will capture the flocculent more quickly, which I'm sure is also helpful to the gills of your fish because that was, especially with the yellow tangs, that's a major concern that it can affect yellow tangs. So I thought, well, where have you been for nine years? <laughs> I haven't had this at all. I've just let the skimmer pull it out. It always does. I can totally lift the lid and look and see inside. The skimmate has like this white chalky look to it because that was what it pulled out of the water and the phosphate is now gone. So I've always relied on my protein skimmer to do the job. Now I can run a filter sock, you know, a 10 micron, and I do it occasionally, but it's so rare. Usually I just put in the phosphate RX, count the drops, done, walk away, the next day the phosphates are low. And I, and I have a yellow tank swimming around through this stuff too. But I'm also not dosing it at what would be considered full strength. 
I dose about 125 drops. I believe for my water volume, I would need to dose something like 270 drops. I think that's right. It's six drops for 10 gallons. Two hundred and seventy drops, yeah, but I use like one hundred and twenty-five, so I'm using less than half the strength, and it still knocks my phosphates down. So I would just say, if you're going full strength, then probably you do want to go ahead and use, and that full strength is to bring it down from 0.5 to zero. So if you're at 0.25, you don't need full strength; you need half the strength, and so in that case, you know the protein skimmer should be able to pull it out. Now, I haven't used phosphate or X at all in Caitlin's tank because there's nothing there that can pull it out. I have no protein skimmer on that tank. So I would actually have to rig up some kind of a power head, like a CJ pump, plugged into a filter sock, and then let it just trap it, and then remove this apparatus from my tank the next day, and now the phosphates will be down. But I will measure today and see what that number is. Alex says, are there any benefits to using closed loops instead of power heads? Well, the main benefit is you can have a lot of flow and not see any pumps in your tank. That's a, that's a huge benefit. And it just comes down to what pump you're going to use and where you and is your tank drilled for the holes for the closed loop. And if you want to set one up that way, you definitely could. And a lot of people do use closed loops, especially bigger tanks. There was a, I got a story to tell you that I haven't told in a while. There was a guy named Travis. He lived on Reef Central. He shared his huge aquarium, which was probably like 500 gallons, and it had a closed loop under it to circulate the water through the aquarium. And then he bought a very fancy protein skimmer, probably the Royal Exclusive uh, Red Dragon, uh, the one that uses the Red Dragon pump. It's a beautiful skimmer. It uses red and white uh, PVC colors and uh, super expensive, right? And he got the skimmer and he tried to put in the sump and when he, and he got the skimmer in, but when he tried to put the collection cup on there, it wouldn't fit. So he needed like this much space to get the collection cup to fit. And he looked at that closed loop plumbing and he said, if I could change that one part out, I would be able to resolve this. You know, I could get my skimmer operational, but it was going to be a project because it's the bulkhead coming out the bottom of this tank. And <laughs> so he had this master plan. And um, <laughs> so obviously he had to remove, I'm sure he removed the sump too. I just think he did. Because the one thing he said to us, and he typed this, he didn't do a video. A video would have been fantastic. But he typed out this story and he said that he took off all of his clothes and he put on some goggles. And I don't know if he just means goggles like for swimming, like the little tiny ones, or a scuba mask, or what. But I, I picture naked Travis with his goggles under the tank. He disconnects the plumbing, thinking that he's going to be able to like change something. I don't even know what he was going to change. But basically, when he took it down, or I mean, when he took off whatever was connected, water just started to gush out like crazy. It's a 500-gallon tank. And he just put his hand over it like, to stop the splatter for whatever he's going to swap out. I still don't, maybe he had a certain length of pipe that was screwed into this bulkhead and he was going to put a shorter pipe to screw in and that would resolve the issue. But he had to remove one to put the other. But it's, anyway, the water is gushing out. He slams his hand against it to stop the water from crashing down. He's completely naked, getting a shower and the water is hitting the electrical outlets and sparks are flying out at him from all directions. And uh, he did solve it. He did get the plumbing reconnected, which is a miracle, and got his protein skimmer <laughs> operational. But after that, I always called him Travis the Naked Reefer. <laughs> and I asked him to change his username because that was insane. I would never have done that. I would have somehow gone down from the top of the tank and found that closed loop hole and put a plug on it or something so there's only this much water in the pipe, just a little bit to drain. I would never have just tried to disconnect the pipe and stop the water and screw in a pipe as it's gushing out. Oh my God, I can't even, and this, the sparks, that's the funniest part for me. Just the, he's getting burned by electricity trying to do this insanity while he's completely naked. It, it's, it's the best. What a guy. I, I love that he shared the story though, it's great. 
Vivi says, have you tried using ozone? What are your thoughts? I have not. I've never seen the need for it, and probably because I always buy Starfire tanks. I think that, uh, I, I, I would assume that a Starfire tank could look even more crystal clear with ozone than without, but I've, I've never found the need for it in all the tanks I've run in the last 26 years. I started off with a 29 gallon that was not Starfire, and then I got a 55 that was not Starfire, and then I got a 280 that was, and I had the 280 for six years. And then after that, I ended up with a 215 temporarily because of the 400 leak. That was Starfire. The 400 was Starfire. The Anemone Cube was Starfire. All those tanks had this crystal clear glass. And I find that just running carbon, a half a cup of carbon per 50 gallons for three days is all you need to make the water look nice and clear and pretty. And I've never had to worry about ozone. I, hadn't, I didn't have to worry about inhaling any or having any leak in the room or causing any kind of damage or maintain some equipment or worry about the odors. It's just I haven't had the need. But there are others that like to use it. Lord Thornton asked a question, but I have no idea what it is. Can SPSD recolonize bleach skeleton? Maybe you mean can SPS recolonize bleach skeleton? Um, if there's any life left from an SPS coral, any polyps, they can regrow over whatever. It is possible. It just depends where it is on the skeleton itself. For example, I had a spot where I had um, a few polyps left over on a piece of Tonga branch. And I ended up putting zip ties to hold the Tonga branch in a certain spot. And the SPS completely covered the branch and the zip ties. You could literally see the shape of like a seat belt. <laughs> But it was covered in skin of SPS coral and then the little hairy uh, threads you know, from the miliopora. The, the acros polyps were coming off of it, but you could totally tell where the zip ties were. My plan originally was going to be cut the zip ties off at some point, but I never did. And it looked really, really neat. But if you have a coral that bleached at the base, for example, it's unlikely the SPS will work its way downward to cover that area up and make it colorful again. Usually what happens is corals are growing upward toward the light, and so whatever is bleached at the bottom is sacrificial. And like I was saying in last week's show, you might just take the coral out and buzzsaw off the bottom and then put the, what's left of the colony down lower in the tank so you have more vertical height for the coral to grow some more, and you ought to keep looking at this white area under your colony. It's kind of tricky, though, because now that you've taken it out and you've cut it, it might break into multiple pieces. And it's always hard to replant it because the shape doesn't match the structure of your rock work. And so you're using putty and glue trying to get it locked into that sweet spot. But I have done that. And then other times I did, I remember I had a acro that was called the Scripps Acro. It's Acropora microphthalma, I think. And it was a super fast grower and I really liked it. But I had all this decay at the bottom, just looked like garbage. And I kept saying, one day I'm gonna deal with that. And then one day I did. And I took it all out and I cut off the bottom one or two inches. And then I took every one of those little sticks that I had left and I planted them all in the, the ridge like, like hair standing up. And it was just a really nice solution. That It looked so much better to me. I didn't see dead. I didn't see Valonia. I didn't see Aptasia. I just got rid of all that undergrowth, that garbage down below, and just planted it. And again, like I said, I had more growing space above it for that coral to grow upward again. And in six to nine months... It was already doubling in volume and looking so much better. It had more flow going through the coral because I got rid of all that undergrowth. So there's that. But it just depends what you're talking about because you could be talking about how the tips turned whiter or died. And if that's the case, that part, if it doesn't get covered in algae, the SPS can grow and cover all that up again and it'll be fine. So there's always a chance. Hmm... Kevin says, should I tie in the plumbing for a separate frag tank or should I keep it isolated from the display for optimal results of frags? I need to read up on frag tanks, probably need different levels. Um, okay, so ideally, tying in your frag, your frag tank into your reef is the best way for success because the reef has everything correct and everything's being, you know, the temperature's right, the lighting is right, the, the water parameters are right, the skimming is right, all that filtration's in place and just adding one satellite tank to the system you get to grow more corals without having to buy a bunch of more gear. But the downside is if something really bad happens in your tank, it's possible that the frag tank will be taken out. So that's why you might say, I want to have a separate frag tank. 
that I can uh, enjoy and, uh, and tinker in and test things out in. I mean, you can do all those things in a separate tank. And I have a separate frag tank. And many times I wish it was tied into my system because it'd be so much easier to maintain. I had certain water parameters I could never correct in the frag tank and I could not figure out what was wrong. And it was just kind of a struggle bus. You know, it just, it just never did well. I was like, ugh. But, and then at one point, I think it was after Dwayne came, we reset the tank. We got rid of some questionable rock that made no sense. Just got rid of it and put in what we thought was okay. And we put in a bunch of frags and the frags are doing great. And it was, and I, I was like, okay, finally I have like backup. So if something bad happens to my tank, I would have all these extra corals left over that I could restart in my tank if I needed, you know, like little uh, Easter eggs. But unfortunately what happened was I did a big water change in my tank and then I started losing a lot of corals. Well, I did a water change on that frag tank too and lost a bunch of corals over there too. It ended up being the salt mix and that scenario just bit me and it, it uh, affected everything and I lost a lot of SPS in both systems so my backup corals were wiped out too so it didn't even matter that the tank was separate because <laughs> I still got nailed from both so there is a chance that you will lose everything no matter what but I prefer tying it in and Dwayne's beautiful reef tank it's a fantastic SPS tank it plums through the wall and goes out to an outside building that's a, a part of his home and in that outside building has multiple tanks and they're all part of the same ecosystem. And he can have uh, corals growing in abundance in those tanks and they might be covered in algae, but it doesn't migrate into the reef inside the house, which is really impressive. He ends up having a really nice reef inside and he might have the tank out here that's plagued with Aptasia and another tank plagued with hair algae, but it's not in the main display. So it's, it's easier to have it tied into the main system if you can. Juan says, have you ever thought about setting up an auto fish feeder for frozen or liquid food? Eh, no, I haven't. Uh, I know some people do that, and I've seen some great ideas. I'll tell you one idea I saw probably two years ago in the Neptune group on Facebook. This guy had this little round thing in the middle of his area where he had his dose pumps, and he had his controllers, and he, I don't know. He had all this stuff, but there was this round thing, and I didn't know what it was. It just, it was strange. And I was like, what is that thing? And then he revealed that it was a wine chiller. And I thought, man, that's brilliant. So he got this wine chiller that just plugs into probably the apex or maybe just plugs into an outlet in the wall. And he just maintains a certain temperature of maybe like 44 degrees. And he put in the liquid food he wanted to dose to his tank and it kept it chilled all the time. Now, the reason I didn't recognize what I was looking at is because not only did he get himself a wine chiller, he painted it to match all the other Neptune equipment. So it was the orange and gray. And that's why it kind of looked like a Neptune product that I've never seen before in my life. And I thought, what is that thing? And when he explained, I was like, yeah, it's, it's really smart. And then he used a dosing pump and he dosed out of that and into the tank and it trickled in whatever the food was he was using. So there is, the, that's one method. Another method is to actually take like a, a dorm refrigerator and drill holes through it and run tubing through it to basically create a closed loop that's passing through the refrigerated cabinet and into the tank all the time. So it's always moving water all the time. And then it would, there was dosing pumps inside this refrigerator, which is kind of interesting. You wouldn't really think they'd last long in there, but apparently it's not a thing. And they would trickle the food into this pipe of running water and it would send that food into the tank and it would just dose these different foods from a refrigerator. And then another guy, he did a thing in a freezer and it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. So he created what looked like a turntable, like a record player, and he had a bunch of pipes glued to the circular thing. And there was some kind of a motor, some kind of a stepper motor probably, that would turn the record player one notch at a time. Maybe it moved forward one pipe a day. Maybe it was three or four pipes per day, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, I don't know. And he had frozen food in each of those pipes. Okay, and then that food, that's frozen would have to somehow get into his reef. Well, he set up a hair dryer in there that would turn on and blow hot air on the food to melt it in the pipe <laughs> where, you know, cause the pipes are pivoting under the hair dryer. So when it was time for this one, the hair dryer came on and just blew hot air in there and melted the food. And then the hair dryer turned off again. And I was just picturing, you've got a freezer full of frozen food and you're filling it up with hot air temporarily and then the freezer has to compensate for that and bring the cold back down again 
but that was the most DIY apparatus I'd ever seen. I'd never seen one use a hair dryer inside a freezer. So there, there are ways to do it. It's pretty crazy. Thomas, if your coral is only two weeks old and it turned brown, that's okay. Because corals will do that. They're getting used to your system. And you give them another eight or ten weeks and they can regain their color again. Uh, what lights do you have over your tank? <clears throat> John says, here in England there are so many hobbyists selling frags, so it's hard for the local fish store to survive, but we have the budget and we buy frags from people we know. Yeah, when you have a budget and you're trying to follow it, you are going to go for the best deal. But I do recommend spending some money at your fish store as well. Maybe it's not corals, maybe you're buying the occasional fish, or you're buying fish food, or you're buying test kits. You know, do something to kind of keep the doors open, you know, because if you had your own business too, whatever, maybe you do, maybe you have your own business, you want people to keep buying from you because you need to eat, just like the fish store needs to eat. I mean, everyone needs to eat. Everyone has to work and do something for the next guy, and we just kind of keep the circular motion where the money just keeps going to the next person, and that's just how the planet works. Eric says, how long do you have to quarantine a new fish to be safe? My wife and I are getting our last fish, a McCusker's Rass, from our local fish store. I'll be purchasing safety stock from you as well. Um, I would say if you're doing observation, a minimum of three weeks. And if you can go 21 days and nothing looks strange, then you probably will be okay to add it to your tank. Because within 21 days, something should have been seen. Now, I would do the safety stop with your new fish. And then I would put it in that quarantine tank for the three weeks. And then, like I said, if there's no surprises, you can then put it in your reef. But if something does come up, then you can move it into a hospital tank with the right medication for whatever plague it's suffering from and get it nice and healthy. And then once it's healthy, then you can put it in your tank. So that would be the best approach I can give you. Uh, Thomas said that he was having to head out, but I do want to say thank you for the super chat. I saw that sneak in here. I appreciate it. Doghouse Reefer says, your tank is looking really good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I agree. And that's a video that I shot last week. So this is not an old video like, you know, months ago. This is where we are now. I can hide myself for a moment here. Let me shrink myself down over here. So you can look in the middle and see what you've been missing all this time. But yeah, it does seem like the fish seem to congregate mostly on the right side of my reef. I used to have an auto feeder on the left side of the tank that would drop in food twice a day. And that really helped get the fish to move to both ends of the tank. But since I only feed frozen at night, and some nori goes in the tank as well, but even then I feed the back. I probably should put the nori over here on the uh, far left side, <laughs> just to entice them to come visit over there. All right. But yeah, no, the tank's been looking good for months. I'm very happy with it. <clears throat> Thomas, you're welcome to come see it in person. Just got to make the trip here to Texas. Thank you, Andrea. She posted the link for the filter socks I sell. I sell the 10 micron 4-inch socks and the 7-inch socks. And the dimension is the plastic ring on the top. These are from Blue Life USA, and I buy them in quantities of 100 at a time. So I usually always have plenty in stock. If you need a handful of them, I'll be happy to ship them your way. And because they're so light, they don't cost much in shipping. All right. Um, guys, I think we're going to wrap up here because I do have some stuff to do before I have a customer coming over to pick up his order. Last Sunday, I just happened to check my computer and I had someone place a nice big order. They ordered a triple dosing container. They ordered an Apex Pro. I mean, I was like, whoa, that was a nice transaction. So I guess I should end up saying, you know, if you're watching these live streams, I do appreciate when you go to Milo's Reef and you, milosreef.com and you buy things because that's what helps pay the bills. It, it literally is the only thing I do for a living. I don't have some side hustle. My hustle is all day long Milo's Reef, and I'm building products for customers or I'm boxing up things I sell. My website carries about 300 different products. They're all in the dry goods. I don't sell livestock at this time. I don't know that I ever will, but I guess I should never say never. Um, maybe one day that's all I can do is sell coral. <laughs> but for now, I'm healthy. So I am selling dry goods, and I sell pumps and lights and filters and additives and of course all the acrylic things I make like skimmer stands and lids for your overflow boxes and photo boxes 
and top off containers and dosing containers and sumps and uh, little brackets to hold your MP60 to your tank. I know some people have been asking me to make the MP40 ones and I've not been able to yet because they're too small. They just fly off the CNC machine and they look all chopped up. They get destroyed because they're too small. <clears throat> Josh says, uh, I might be moving to Texas very soon. May end up begging to come see your tank. Yeah, you definitely can. I live in Fort Worth. So I'm over here near Dallas. <clears throat> and if you are going to be between Houston and San Antonio, you are going to be about four and a half, five hour drive away. But I'm totally worth the trip. So, all right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in today and putting up with the show. I hope I'm going to play back and see how bad I did. But uh, I, I really did want to show you that stuff that AJ did. I thought it was really impressive. And I will give you another update on this tank here in a few months because it's something that I helped, uh, helped him set up. And he's doing a great job so far, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it becomes. Have a great weekend. And I will not – I don't know. I think next weekend the live stream will be a little bit later because we've got an event happening at the local fish store that's down the street, and it ends at 2, and my stream starts at 2.08. I don't know. Maybe I could set it up and still be on time. Maybe I'll be a little bit late next Saturday, but I do feel like there is a conflict schedule-wise. So there, your, that's your heads up in case I'm not, in case I'm a no-show for some reason. That would be why. All right, guys. Bye.